House Bill 866 is uh, primary and secondary education, health and safety guidelines, procedures, and digital devices. And Madam Chair, it's my third time in front of you this week, and on committee, it's great to see you again and again. Uh, the purpose of the bill is requiring the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in consultation with the State Department of Education to develop health and safety guidelines and procedures for the use of digital devices in public school classrooms. We're requiring each county board of education to implement certain health and safety guidelines and procedures for the use of digital devices in public school classrooms beginning in a certain school year generally related to health and safety guidelines procedures for digital devices. Um, the use of digital devices in the schools is a concern because of the harmful effects of blue light that is emitted. The blue light comes from the computer screens, Chromebooks, and other handheld devices that we feel are detrimental to the eye. And you'll see some uh, evidence here as we move forward. Uh, this bill will direct the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in consultation with the state to develop medically sound classroom guidelines. This will help protect the students and prevent risks posed by the daily use of these devices. I, I guess as we started looking at digital devices when we were kids, we thought, boy, wouldn't it be great to give computers to every kid? And that is a worthy cause. However, I don't know about you all, but when I was a kid, we were always warned about watching TV and what it could do to our eyes, and that's what the doctors used to tell us when we went to get there. So in our attempts to really give our kids a better education, I think we might have looked a little bit past this type of uh, event, if you will, and, and moved a little too fast. And all we're asking here is that the department come through with some specific guidelines that are keep our kids and our, our child's health. Thank you. Cindy Eckert. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for hearing this bill. My name is Cindy Eckhard, and I have a little bit of dual uh, testimony. Um, I wanted to show the committee uh, a little video, and then I it will give you a good idea, I think, of what we're talking about. So I'm just going to, the IT department for the General Assembly is wonderful, and they've already put this on the desktop for us. In adults and children alike, long periods of staring at screens may induce severe eye strain and contribute to myopia or nearsightedness. You know, there is an increasing rate of nearsightedness around the world. We stare at something up close for, for hours and hours. Your eye muscles have to focus at that near range and that can be fatiguing. The other thing is dryness. And when you're not blinking, when, when we're on computers, our blink rate can decrease by up to 50%. And when you're not blinking and you're staring and your eyes are wide open, those tears evaporate very quickly. You get dry spots that can cause blurred vision. It can cause redness. Pain. Sitting with improper posture or with a monitor that is too close or misaligned frequently leads to neck and back pain. Staring at computer screens in the last hours before sleep can inhibit the production of the hormone melatonin. Sleeplessness resulting from suppressed melatonin may heighten anxiety and reduce cognitive function and contribute to chronic conditions such as obesity, high blood pressure, depression, diabetes, and depressed immune response. But apart from these conditions, children alone face another grave risk from unregulated exposure to bright display screens. Did you know these electronics are emitting a very dangerous blue light? A new report says that the light that they emit could damage your eyes. The blue light coming from those screens can be dangerous for growing eyes. Unfiltered, high energy visible light or blue light can cause permanent damage to retinal pigment epithelial cells and photoreceptors. Blue light is a very bad player. It damages the retina and causes macular degeneration. Here is the reason children are especially susceptible to blue light's damaging effects. We are all born with clear lenses in our eyes that do not filter blue light and allow it to travel all the way to the retina in the back of the eye. As we grow older, our lenses acquire a yellow-brown tint called ocular lens pigment. Oh. Well, an associate professor at the Illinois College of Optometry, and uh, I wanted to uh, commend you on all the work that you've done to develop um, and to consider legislation that may help students in Maryland with uh, digital devices in the classroom. I think uh, it appears that you've been well-educated on the, the facts of um, how uh, many hours kids are spending on these devices, and I, I, I commend you for looking at opportunities to at least consider the impact on these devices um, for children. So um, I, I heartily support um, HB 866, and I encourage you to, uh, to, to pass this good legislation for Maryland kids. Thanks.
I hope that gives everybody a sense of what we're facing in our classrooms. Before I begin, I'd really like to thank, of course, Delegate Arents and the members in this room who have co-sponsored the bill. Delegates Eric Ebersole, April Rose, Haven Shoemaker, and Jimmy Tarlow. Thank you very much. They have joined Delegate Arents, our hero, making a total of 26 members in the House of Delegates representing nearly every county to safeguard Maryland students from well-documented avoidable me. harm. Excuse me, but I'm going to only give you one minute to finish up because the video was more than three minutes, okay? I'm sorry, that okay. was not what we were told. Oh. I'm happy to just cut to the chase. Okay. The bottom line is this. The schools are asking our children to use hazardous devices every day. There are no safety guidelines in place. This bill puts those safety guidelines in place, and it puts the direction of those safety and health guidelines in the hands of doctors. That's why MedCHI, the state medical society, is endorsing this bill. So is the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Best of all, HB 866 is free of charge. Legislative Services reports in its fiscal policy note that there is no cost associated with the passage of this bill. Students are protected from permanent harm. Teachers are protected from additional liability because it's their responsibility to have a safe classroom free of known hazards. And so, as we've heard today, this is a win-win. I also would like Could to draw you your... summarize, please? Yes, I'd like to draw your attention to the earlier testimony about gambling. It is not just vision that this bill addresses. It's not just vision that we're talking about with the health. It's their musculoskeletal development, as well as anxiety, depression, and yes, addiction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Weber. Yes. Good afternoon, delegates. I'm Leslie Weber, a co-founder of Advocates for Baltimore County Schools. We're the largest public education advocacy coalition in Baltimore County with nearly 2,000 members. ABC Schools is asking for your support for HB 866. We are not anti-tech. We understand there's a place for technology in schools, but we know that technology has to be used safely and judiciously to protect children. OSHA has had computer-related computer safety um, standards in place for decades. Schools are children's places of work, and in our digitally transformed classrooms across the state, students are now facing the same potential ha hazards as adults perhaps more, because their bodies and minds are still developing. Professionally developed, research-based, and age-appropriate classroom gu guidelines for the safe use of digital devices in schools are needed for all Maryland schools, but are especially needed in Baltimore County, where one of the nation's largest one-to-one -one digital initiatives is underway. Unlike most districts in the country, our digital transformation began in elementary schools, this means that children as young as five are having curriculum delivered to them via computer software and are therefore spending every day on a digital device. At home, there's homework and very likely time spent gaming or using social media. This adds, all, adds up to a lot of screen time, greatly surpassing the two-hour limit recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. We can't control what children do in their free time, but can ensure that the schoolhouse is a safe place for them to be. Passage of this bill, which enjoys bipartisan support, will prove Maryland to be a national leader in school safety, since we believe it's the first bill of its kind in the nation. Children must be protected from the well-documented harmful effects of misused or overused digital devices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Klein. Yes, hi there. My name is Lisa Klein, and I'd like to thank you all for including me in this important conversation. I'm here today from Gaithersburg, Maryland, where I serve as a PTA co-president at my son's elementary school. I get a lot of feedback from parents. I'm kind of a human su suggestion box. Uh, mostly good things, but a lot of the negative comments come around the Chromebooks. Um, viewing of inappropriate content, pornography most recently, accidentally and on purpose, have happened in our classrooms. Um, headaches, eye strain, dizziness come to the nurse frequently. Um, Many homes are complaining that their kids are suffering from digital addiction and the schools aren't helping with that. One parent said, you know, they didn't even ask me. They just put my kid in front of a Chromebook. He's six years old. We don't do that at home. Another parent said her kids get to sit cross-legged in the classroom with 
laptops on their lap and they work there for hours a day. That violates the FCC safety warnings that say to keep the device eight inches from your body. Parents say the device shortens their child's attention span and their ability to interact. I don't have to read and tell you about all the double-blind, peer-reviewed studies to validate their observations. I think you know and I know they're right. One parent asked me, why do kids need to hunch over a computer to learn and take tests? What's wrong with blue books and number two pencils? Well, it's a good question, and it's a lot cheaper, isn't it? Well, that same day, my son came home and said a child was so nervous about taking the park exam on his Chromebook, he threw up all over it. And he wasn't the only one. There were three that day that did that. And I pity the IT department to have to clean them. Um, well, the point is that young kids and computers may not be the best combination. It's time, through this legislation, HB 866, that we make computers in school kid-friendly, especially now, as Montgomery County considers allowing elementary schoolers to bring phones to school and use them unsupervised on the bus. A steel enclosure, mind you, that the American Association of Pediatrics warns amplifies RF radiation exposure. This is wrong. It is time for this bill. HB 866 fills the gap between the kids and the IT department. Chief technology officers like ours are plugging in the kids without knowing how it impacts their health. Not that I blame them. They're not doctors. Years ago, I participated in a medical study. My daughter died of leukemia, sadly. And it, the, the, the research I have learned about pediatric leukemia is staggering. All the environmental factors that contribute to killing cells, DNA damage. It's real and it's out there. And we can't see it all. But I will tell you that Wi-Fi radiation is on the same list with benzene, DEET, and lead. And those aren't welcome in our classroom either. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Jane Lee? Yes. Good afternoon, delegates. I'm here representing the PTA Council of Baltimore County. It's 150 local PTAs and 30,000 members. I'm not going to read you our letter. You have that before you. You don't need me to read it. What I'm going to go over, and they've already told you what the effects of the vision, the effects of screen time on the learning process, but there's also the screen time effect on the psychological development of a child. We are starting, especially in Baltimore County, we have one-on-one -on -one co computers or tablets for our youngest children. Many of them without guidelines are on those tablets nearly the entire day. There is no guideline, there is no regulation of how long. Pediatric studies have shown two hours, some of these kids are on there over five. This means that what's lacking is their ability to interact in social situations, their interpersonal relationships, their ability to work with peers. This is very concerning to our parents. They're concerned about the vision problems. That won't show up till later in life. But right now, their children aren't learning how to relate to each other. This leads us to a problem down the road. We're going to have problems with children. We know what happens with people that don't relate and don't develop relationships. Then we're going to have court problems later in life. These children should have technology, but that technology needs to be integrated with, with their safety. And we're asking for guidelines to be made by the professionals, not by us, so that our children are safe 10, 20 years down the road. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Delegate Luke, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Delegate, thank you for the bill. I appreciate the um, intent behind it. Um, a couple questions. So your, your goal here is not to um, ban digital devices, right? Okay, so we're looking at common sense, health-based, research-based restrictions here. Um, so the, there was a lot of conversation in the testimony here about visual impacts, and particularly the blue light studies that have focused on the impact on circadian rhythms and recommended not using screens near bedtime, which obviously wouldn't be happening in school, but there is some truth to that. But this bill's pretty broadly written, so it would affect things like ergonomics and I'm seeing some nodding heads. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. So 
if MSD were, for example, to determine that students shouldn't be using computers at their existing student desks, like the pupil desks that exist right now in most schools, these guidelines could require that this, every school system in the state replace every desk in the state. You know, Delegate, I, under, I understand that, and that's, I think I prefaced uh, my, my testimony with, you know, we've geared ourselves, run ourselves around with this, and, and that's the methodology we, we have chosen as, uh, I guess, leaders, if you will, for our schools. The school system chose that. Um, I think Cindy has a little bit more information on that, but fundamentally, I, I think you're right. The issue with the difference between MSDE putting in guidelines and DHMH putting in guidelines is significant. Mostly because we need people who are already in the medical community who have access to new information. Remember, this is all very new. We've had people on computers for a long time. We haven't had five-year-olds on them. And so the pediatricians, and that's why I'm so glad they've endorsed this, the pediatricians who know the difference between the development of a three-year-old, the development of a five-year-old, and the development of an 18-year-old, these may be three different sets of guidelines. That's why we need the practitioners. Right, but th that wasn't really my question. My question was these regulations, I mean, because the fiscal note says there's no fiscal impact of developing the regulations, but there could certainly be a massive fiscal impact on the school system depending on what the regulations are. I think are. that's a straw man argument. I think it's, I've never heard it. What the fiscal note actually says is it's real easy to mitigate the damage by reducing screen time. So I don't see any cost effective, I don't see any cost impact in just taking a break or using these in a way that reduces the harm. What we're looking for is the, the people in our government, DHMH and MSDE, working together to create a healthy balance for the computers that they already have and guidance on how to use them appropriately. As for the melatonin at night, if you're on a computer all day at school, you have to study at night on that laptop. And so the schools are directing the kids to use these things into the night and they, that is impacting melatonin at the direction of the schools who have a legal responsibility to avoid known harm. We now have a known harm. Ma'am, I don't disagree that there are health impacts here. And okay. I don't disagree that the schools should be doing something about it. The discussion needs to be about the most effective way to do that. And in a way that's based on, I think you'll admit that while there's some research to back some of this up, there's also some conversations about technology that are not research focused. And we want to make sure that this is all research focused. And we also want to make sure that the school systems are actually able to implement it in an effective way. So. Your belief is that the medical research is not enough that it would require, for example, large-scale replacement of seating in the classroom? Not a bit. Taking breaks, stretching, using it appropriately, and addressing the park testing in particular, as we've heard today, it's 110 minutes straight for one unit of testing for an 11-year-old child. There is exactly one break that's allowed. It's three minutes long, and it's often not given because the teachers want to rush through it. That's the kind of common sense that we're talking about here is, okay, let's slow down and let's make sure that the doctors are working with the educators to create a healthy balance so our kids can master this technology without being harmed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say, my goodness, I, I don't know why I didn't think of this because I feel like I've been fighting this battle with my own daughters for, um, gosh, for probably the last four or five years. And, you know, everything you're saying is absolutely spot on. I mean, just the, the addiction, really, to these devices. My question is this, um, and, and it's not just the addiction, obviously, they, they're, they're, they're being required to use it at school, and there has to be a safe way to do it. Um, but the challenge I'm having um, that hopefully you would be open to is that young people are also bringing their, their personal cell phones into the classroom as well. So um, what I've seen in terms of addiction is not so much those devices that are in the classroom, but there's also their own personal devices, and sometimes now in school they're being required to look things up on their own personal devices. And in that time, they're texting each other, cheating on exams. That's going on a lot, but that obviously isn't part of this, this bill. But would you be open to including personal cell phones in that study and how 
how to either incorporate them into into classwork or or bar them from classwork. First Would you all, be open to that? First of all, it's not a study. This dictates, this mandates that DHMH creates guidelines and that they get implemented. There's no study. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I appreciate and respect the position of any educator who says a lot of this is a local decision, a lot of this is a local school board. So I don't believe that this bill even addresses cell phones whatsoever. I think those are local school board issues. What is not local, what is uh, important across the straight, this state is that we have uniform safety guidelines for the school equipment. Whether or not the school lets cell phones in is up to them. Mm -hmm. um, however, regarding addiction, if you key into a lot of what the popular literature is among educators, you'll find a lot of interesting words. One of them is gam gamification. I know that sounds like an odd word, but as I was listening to the testimony earlier, and I found, listened to that nice man talk about being addicted at the age of 10, that's what we're looking at here. When everything is presented like a happy little bubble, a, a click, 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 and when the curriculum itself is being encouraged to be gamified, when you have a teacher in a classroom with Google Classroom encouraging the kids to constantly email each other, sitting next to each other in class, emailing each other, that is the encouragement, in my personal opinion, of a very dangerous and unnecessarily dangerous position. So it folds over. If the teacher is telling you to email, well, then you're, you've got to have a cell phone. You've got to email. It is the behavior. It's the constant behavior of the kids on screens, whether or not they're at school or whether or not they're at home. What we can regulate is what is in the school. Okay, thank you. The chair. Okay, so um, I think I'm circling back. I might be saying the same thing that Delegate Lukey said. Oftentimes, it's hard for me to think of something that he hasn't thought of already. <laughs> <laughs> but I try. <laughs> So um, I'm just reading the language, of, uh, and it's in an education article, so it says in consultation with the department. Of course, that, exactly refers, right. to, that recurs, occurs to, rec refers to the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, consultation means that DHMH still gets to call the shots in the end. So I'm wondering if we couldn't amend it in some way so that they would work together to develop these so that MSDE could have input on the efficacy of some of the decisions that are made in terms of what they can actually manage financially. I'm hoping they're grown-ups. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that doctors are going to lead the way and that MSDE is going to work with them as grown-ups to protect the kids. So my question still is, is would it be possible, I, I'm going to ask the sponsor this question, to, would it be possible to consider an amendment where, they, where it's a, a joint decision by these two groups rather well, than I, one I, calling the shots for the other? I, I believe it would be possible. I think they need to talk. They need to have the information right. so the doctors would have to figure out what the schools are actually doing. And sometimes so, yeah. we have to tell them, too. They're grown-ups, but sometimes they don't like to talk I, to yes. each other. So, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up on that again, as the bill is currently written, as the delegate points out, MSDE could say, well, here's you know, the impact on education of these new requirements, but what this bill is saying is that DHMH can just say, nah, sorry, we're just going to issue these without regard to the educational impact. I don't think that it's going to go that way. I don't think it's without regard, and I think our children's health must come first. Okay, you don't think it's going to go that way? Why? <laughs> um, are you asking me or? Go ahead, Delia. Uh, actually, I think... I think what's paramount here, Delegate, is the health of the child. Um, I believe that when I go to a doctor, or if I have my school nurse or I have my doctor, I'm going to go to my doctor. And I think uh, what the bill's intent is is to sit back and say, we know what's hurting our kids or not hurting our kids, and how we're ultimately trying to address the child, not necessarily in school. And I understand your concerns, but we don't know that until the guidelines come out. I think the delegate brought up something about having MSDE involved. Absolutely, because I think they have to sit down and already state what are the guidelines, because I don't think we're clear on that in any school. So I, I see your point. I don't necessarily understand that it's a problem yet, because I really don't know what DHMH is going to do. Yeah, I mean, delegate respectfully, and again, I support the intent of the bill. Um, but it doesn't require consultation with the local school boards, just with MSD. It doesn't require that MSD agree to any requirements. It just requires consultation, which could be one email, like, hey, let us know what you think. It's very broadly drafted. And some of the testimony here today, you know, 
used data that that is not I think based in you know the reality of what medical research is saying there may be a study here or there but for example the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no more than two hours of entertainment screen time a day and to my knowledge they haven't issued recommendations about the amount of screen time that should be used for learning practices so you know that's why I'm expressing these concerns I'd really like to comment on that if I could hold on ma'am um, I think you and I should touch base offline and, and talk through this. I would welcome, you, I would welcome thank you. Very much. you. You said some things that simply aren't true. Um, yes, it's true that the AAP has only issued guidelines regarding entertainment, and I have spoken directly with the National Academy of um, Pediatricians on that issue, and that's why I think you'll find in your packet a letter where the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics is weighing in on this. They have no guidelines in the classroom and they recognize that it's overdue. As for the studies, I would welcome you to go to www.screensandkids.us where there is lengthy documentation. Again, the doctors in this state didn't blithely sign on to this. They recognize there is significant scientific evidence behind the need for this bill. And as for the, the dynamic between DHMH and MSDE, Again, I think that the whole bill is to make them cooperate. I don't see it as a turf war. I see it as a cooperative effort to protect our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. I have one more person on this bill, Pam uh, Casemeyer. Hi, I'm Pam Casemeyer. I'm here behalf, uh, today on behalf of the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the uh, State Medical Society. Maybe I can um, put a little bit of context in this uh, conversation from these, the professional association's perspective. They viewed that they read this bill and, it, and maybe even addressed the question of whether it should be the two agencies equally or in consultation. I think the reason they're here in, in, in support is they think it creates an opportunity for MSDE and DHMH to develop guidelines that would be useful for the local jurisdictions on this issue. There are benefits to technology and there are risks associated with it. I, I, I know that there is research around risk. There's also a lot of conversation about the benefits that people get in the educational system from technology as well. So this is not an all good or bad from their perspective, but I think they've seen a patchwork of policies across the, the states, across the counties. I think it's an area where legitimately the local jurisdictions may or may not have the time or expertise to sit down and put a framework together. I think it's a balance of framework and I think the two, the two departments working together to put a framework together that could be useful for all of the jurisdictions. And so there would be consistency across the jurisdictions as well, which is the other comment that was made um, by the pediatric community is that the consistency in all jurisdictions would be a good thing. Any more questions? Delegate Lukey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Pam. I really mm. appreciate it. Can, um, can I ask, so AAP has this recommendation about two hours of screen time for entertainment purposes. Is mm. AAP nationally working on guidelines more broadly for educational impacts? I may have to get back with you on that answer. I'm not sure. I would suspect there's researchers working on that. I don't know yet what's been officially adopted from the AEP on those issues, but I'm glad to check, I, I'm glad to find out with yeah, that. Can you follow I think up, there's, I, yes, yes, I'd, I'd be will. curious about that and whether yes. FDA or if there's any other guidance or if we, we'd sort of be asking DHMH to consolidate Correct. research and then create everything from scratch. No, I, I, let, me, let me find that out, but I do think there are guidelines, I think there are, is information out there that would be useful. That was the impression I got when they talked about it, mm -hmm. because they actually thought it might be an easier way for, to handle this, to do it with the two departments together, balancing the objectives of pro-technology and risks, and so let me find out and I'll get back to you. Okay, thank you so much, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions from the panel? If not, thank you very much. I believe Delegate Walker, you're next.